<laughs> right, I think we should get going if everyone's ready and um, start on time. So, welcome to this special Letters on Liberty strand and the special Letters on Liberty debate in defence of drag. My name is Ella Whelan. I'm the co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival. I hope you guys all know us by now and know how these debates run. I hope you were here yesterday. I hope you've seen some interesting debates um, throughout today. And uh, I'm also the commissioning editor of these series of pamphlets, Letters on Liberty, which was started in, uh, during lockdown throughout the pandemic. Um, and it was just me and my colleagues Jeff and Alistair in the office. We had lots of people working from home and things like that. And we were going mad uh, and couldn't bear it and couldn't bear the shutdown of public life. So we thought we needed to do something to keep ideas alive. And this was born, Less on Liberty. They were originally just meant to be a few little things. And now we're, I think we're running on about 33 and not stopping anytime soon. So you can get copies of these up on the um, Back of Ideas bookshop store. And uh, it'll be no, uh, no news to anyone here that the issue of drag and drag performance has been uh, much discussed in, uh, in kind of popular political life, um, and not for not contentious reasons. There have been rows related to the kind of gender wars and stuff around gender ideology about... Um, what's appropriate for children, what's appropriate for adults, what's appropriate for anyone, and drag through the drag queen story hour, story time, um, has been sort of called into question. And we at the Academy of Ideas thought, well, is that fair? Um, is, do, are these two things exactly the same, a conversation about kids and a conversation about an art and entertainment form in and of itself? Um, and I watched Vanity Van Glow on a television programme defending drag and talking about the uh, history of drag and the difference between what was happening in something like Drag Queen Story Hour and what happens in you know, a bar in Soho or anywhere else. Um, so we thought it was about time that someone put these words um, on paper and In Defence of Drag was born. So we're here to discuss this Letter on Liberty and also you know, this is in the tradition that the Back of Ideas Festival has of debates on arts and culture. We had a discussion about folk this morning, a discussion about classical music yesterday. And um, so we very much see this as in line with our tradition of being for art and culture and entertainment and fun, which is I'm sure something that Vanity will talk about. So the way it's going to run is that we're going to have an introductory little lecture from Vanity, and then we've got a wonderful panel of respondents. So I'm going to introduce them all now. They all have long, illustrious... Um, <laughs> bios that I have horribly and crudely truncated to save time. I'm also conscious that in particular vanity booth used to a much much more glamorous and better compare than me, so pretend we're in a bar and I look a lot better than I do at this point in the festival. So, to first introduce Vanity, Vanity Von Glow is an internationally involved superstar, cabaret performer and author of this wonderful pamphlet. She's the host of The Vanity Project which is a um, great podcast and interviews lots of really interesting people. Look it up online. Um, she also does shows Drag Queen Wine Tasting and Drag Queen Power Ballads, which are a rollicking roll through, through some of the best, best hits. hits. Um, and, and you can, can find all the information about Vanity Online, so thank you for being here. Next up we have, um, on the end of the table here, Caroline Fisk. Uh, Caroline co-founded Conservatives for Women in 2019 to fight the impact of gender ideology <laughs> on government policy and within the Conservative Party, has been very um, involved and vocal around discussions about gender ideology, women's rights, um, and you know, particularly around what's happening in the law, what's happening in politics, in Parliament, and things like that. So very glad to have Caroline here. Sat next to Caroline there is Dr Don Milligan. Don has been a gay activist, a trade unionist, and a member of the communist movement for many decades. He is the author of The Embrace of Capital, The Politics of Homosexuality, Sex Life, and co-author of The Truth About the AIDS Panic. Um, Don, had, have, have you done your session on capitalism already? Is that yeah. Yes, yeah. you've done. So he's done his session on capitalism, I'm sure some of you will have um, been to. And uh, Don wrote a, um, an article about Drag Queen Story Hour and drag, unpicking some of the 
tensions around this debate, which is why we invited him here, so very glad to have you, Don. Um, sat next to Don is Manik Govinda. Manik is the guest co-curator of Culture Tensions Programme at the, I'm going to say this wrong, Manik, even though I went there, the <laughs> Ujdowski Castle Centre for Contemporary Art in Warsaw, which is a really exciting project in Warsaw in, a, in an art gallery, um, which has very um, topical, contentious debates there, really interesting, and he brings people from actually all over the world um, to come and debate some big issues. He actually in, uh, did one on abortion, which uh, included me at six months pregnant, which you know you can imagine was quite a, it was a great a heated debate. Um, he's been the former founder, director, and trustee of so many arts organizations and projects, I can't name them now, I'm very impressive, and he is one of our key men on the arts at the back of ideas, so we're very delighted to have him here. And then last but not least, sat next to me here is Cresta Wetton. Cresta is a comedian and a panellist on the GB News show Headliners, and you would have seen her there, and very often on Andrew Doyle's Free Speech Nation. Um, you might also have seen her performing, um, in particular for Comedy Unleashed, which I'm sure a lot of you know about. And I, again, asked her on this panel because I saw her discussing Drag Queen Story Hour, um, and liked the kind of nuance that she had around that. So that's our panel. Um, once we get all their very interesting uh, speeches out of the way, we'll head straight out to you guys in true pack of ideas style. So can you please join me in welcoming Vanity to the table? <laughs> Um, thank you, Ella. This is very strange for me to not have a martini glass in my hand <laughs> while I address a group of people. Um, I've got about ten minutes that I'm going to do my introduction, um, which is two and a half of the first three songs of Abba Gold, but I have decided instead I'm going to talk about my letter on liberty. Um, first of all, though, I think it's important to talk about what drag is. Um, a drag queen's mission, and it's important to say this just for clarity, a drag queen's mission is to entertain, not to satisfy a kink. Um, if it is to satisfy a kink, then we're not really talking about drag so much as transvestism, and while I could say a lot about that, it's not my area of qualification. Um, so let's remember that while the drag queen's impetus for taking to the stage is certainly attention-seeking, it is not exhibitionist. Further, it's important to remember that a drag queen isn't pretending to be a woman, not exactly. You know, no one would go to a drag show um, if it weren't in the knowledge that what they're seeing is smoke and mirrors, what they're watching is folly and farce. Drag is not a deceit, drag is a conceit. And I say that the conceit doesn't mock women so much as it mocks all of us. It mocks identity, and it reveals and often revels in human pomposity. Now, what do I mean? Well, I've always felt like a good drag performance should take on all the characteristics of playing a game a game of masks and illusion in which the performer is doing a kind of kabuki dance. They'll oscillate between the presented persona um, and the reality that the whole thing is actually just a joke. So some people find this perceptual gear shift quite jarring and uncomfortable, jumping between the committed performance and the wink wink nudge nudge of it all. You know, there's always, like, imagine you're a family 50th and they've booked a drag queen. I think you're gonna be familiar with the person that I'm talking about. There's always a person who, when the drag queen's, you know, making fun of Uncle John and singing the song and doing a bit of mock flirting with someone, there's like a particular genre of heterosexual man who feels it's very important to say, he better not come anywhere near me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that this person's kind of afraid of what the dynamic says about them. And in these moments, we see that this person is a poor, unfortunate soul. They've come to the party, but they haven't come to play. Games obviously work within an established framework, and the framework of drag posits identity as being fundamentally frivolous. And that's why this self-serious gentleman doesn't get it. In my letter on liberty, I explore some of the like subsets of drag, and I don't have time to go into too much depth of them all right now, but I'll give you a whistle-stop tour of some drag archetypes that will probably get me in trouble with my fellow professionals. <laughs> We're all familiar with the class, classic British drag queen, or as I like to call them, the pig in the wig at the end of the pier. <laughs> <laughs> so this is usually a tattooed bloke, they're in a sequin gown, they're in a Brighton cabaret bar, and they are murdering I am what I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking 
thinking of my friend Cosmic. Um, but if you catch Cosmic at the Queen's Arms on a Thursday night, you will find that she's absolutely hilarious. I mean, a mistress of ceremonies who brings everyone out of their shells. That's what that drag is doing. Um, and there is a trigger warning for this because that type of drag is body. It is highly suggestive, acid-tongued. I mean, it's often just outright explicit. Um, and it's adult humor. But what about celebrity Big Brother contestant, Courtney Act? She's an Australian drag queen and her feminine illusion is part of the aspect of her work that people know her most for. It's the part that's the most beguiling, I think. It's all a bit Barbie and it's a bit Disney princess drag. Or my friend's Kitty Scott Claus from RuPaul's Drag Race. Now she's um, kind of, she's plumptious and silly. Um, a slightly Bridget Jones-esque persona, very bubbly, very campy, but her humour isn't really too ferocious, it's not too eviscerating. I always think that she'd be quite at home on the Loose Woman panel. <laughs> so that's why I call this Holly Willoughby drag. <laughs> now we can go far left afield from that into the psychedelic shaman drag of David Hoyle and his fellow avant-gardists, or the foul-mouthed, foam-wigged, cartoonish Aussie drag of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert the RuPaul supermodel, world, supermodel of the world drag, or there is my personal favorite, the towering Athena-like, late 20th century, elegant, ethereal, angelic, sonic, songstress, beauty type, modeled for you all now. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> of course, as well, there is the pantomime dame we're familiar with, the widow twanky drag. Um, but there is one specific subgenre of drag, and I think this is the one that sticks in the craw of some feminist detractors of drag, which is the Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, kind of, I affectionately call them the pop sluts, um, <laughs> the coyote ugly drag queens, the stripper <laughs> drag queens. Now, I always joke that every drag queen on their journey to get to wherever their creative vision takes them has probably gone through a stripper phase. And... I think that's partly to do with uh, that there is a maximalism of sexually provocative attire, so picturing corsets and fishnets and all that kind of stuff. Um, these are attention-grabbing garments. But they also maximize the attention on the performer without requiring of the performer an enormous amount of talent. <laughs> <laughs> it's also because it costs less. I mean, drag is quite expensive, could you imagine? Um, fishnets, etc., uh, are the cheap choice for the beginner drag queen. So it's kind of like a starter kit for drag. And above all else, um, these queens are modeling their style on the dominant icons of the cultures in which they were raised. So I'm thinking from my generation, Madonna, Janet Jackson, um, then after that, you know, Britney Spears, Pussycat Dolls, and then after that, whatever the fuck they're listening to now. Um, so those were and still are the glam icons for generations of young girls, for generations of young gay men. And if you go back to the 1970s, you'll find that the drag bars were full of Barbara Streisand impersonators or Diana Ross impersonators, and most of them were in floor-length gowns, and the sex, uh, the sexually flirtatious visual aspect wasn't at the forefront of that drag in the same way. Now, I don't want to throw the stripper drag queens under the bus um, because there actually are some like beautiful, talented, this is a disclaimer by the way, some beautiful, talented performers out there who delve into those themes and take it to an aesthetic height. Um, Alexis St. Pete, my friend Honey Fox. So there are people that do that and look a million dollars. Um, but I think that that's the kind of drag that's being particularly controversial at the moment. Now, why do I bring all these subgenres up? It's because whether you're a gender clown or a warrior princess or a glamazon fashionista, the point I'm trying to make is that drag is a broad church. And criticisms of drag usually fail to make the distinction between these different types. The shallow or the passing observer or an American Republican legislator might consider drag's appeal to foremostly be of a prurient interest. They see gaudy and racy attire, the type worn by our cultural stars like Beyonce and Miley Cyrus. They see this and they flatten all, all down into a low resolution image of drag as a whole. If you want to know where reasonable misunderstandings develop into fully fledged hostility, it's right there. It's in the place where the racier embodiments of drag are used to denigrate the entire art form. So do I think that drag queens dressed like baby prostitutes are the best ones to be reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar to children. <laughs> I do not. 
But it makes me sad that in recent chatter on the subject, the uh, subject has been excluded, we've excluded the richness of drag from the debate. And people have purposely characterized these drag queen story time style events as children being drop kicked into the clutches of scantily clad pedophiles. Now, it might sound grandiose, but uh, like rock stars, I believe that drag queens reach for representations of the divine. So I borrow in my shows um, as much from Meatloaf, Steve Tyler, and Freddie Mercury as I do from Maria Callas, Shirley Bassey, Celine Dion. Drag worships incredible talent and unattainable beauty. Um, earlier this year, I <laughs> earlier this year I was on Piers Morgan's show, and I was debating a U.S. culture warrior, Lauren Chen, who described drag as woman face. And it was interesting to me because I feel like drag has less to do with the woman on the street than some critics seem to wish that it did. I always feel like drag is a mirror held up to our celebrity constellation. And that's why you'll very rarely see a drag queen contort themselves for hours in hair and makeup to look like their Aunt Janet. <laughs> now, drag excludes the ordinary. Drag is interested in excess, both because it worships it and because it's amused by it. The woman face argument to me seems like a reflexive retort which shares some DNA with the perpetually offended types who the right wing pundits are usually telling to get a grip. So, Honestly, our, ide our identitarian moment, it exhausts me. You know, people seem more glued than ever to their masks and their characters and their identities. And a fixation with identity, I think it drags people into categories that sometimes separate us rather than connect us. So if you're looking for an ardent proponent of the religion of a thousand genders, I'm not it. Um, I do, of course, have non-binary friends whose creative and inventive reflections on gender I find interesting from an artistic and philosophical perspective, but I don't have much time for political and legislative wrangling on the matter. I feel like the grasp for recognition from clerics of the state leaves creatives frustrated, and I think it's a waste of their gifts. I think that non-conforming minds are best commissioned with the creation of beautiful, inspiring, or even just entertaining work. Non-conforming minds provide a service to society when they give us some existential relief from the grey, dull drudgery of our mundane lives. <laughs> a true drag queen acknowledges that there is a Puritan dislike of mirth and laughter, and that the very moral pomposity which drag serves to disarm. Um, by the way, some drag artists are often just as guilty as their critics on Twitter of this moral pomposity. That is not lost on me. Um, but look, not all drag can be great. And not every creative choice is the right choice. In fact, I would argue that with drag, let's be honest, half the fun of it is that it is often completely crap. <laughs> Ten pints in when you're wearing your knickers on your head, singing, gimme, 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 a man after midnight at two in the morning, and the drag queen is still going, it doesn't really need to be good anymore, do you know what I mean? So as I say in my letter on liberty, while drag can provide you with much to think about, it's not advisable to overthink it. A true drag queen is unfazed by the rabble outside protesting men in dresses. A drag queen may sympathize with concerns, but fearless artists do not capitulate to them. As my personal idol, Bette Midler, once said, fuck them if they can't take a joke. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Vanity. That's excellent. I, I think it's Paris is burning, but I might be getting it wrong. That there, there is a scene where um, drag queens and uh, you know lots of people are doing a kind of catwalk, and the aim of the catwalk is to pass. And there are all these costumes, and part of the performance of passing is they're actually there's a, there's some sections where they're acting out you know office attire, office work, and it's just and it's highlighting the fact that actually. In some way, you talked about masks. We, we wear masks in our daily lives at all different times. I act differently in front of the doctor than I do in front of my mother, than I do in front of my husband, um, than I do at my day job. And so part of uh, 
part is part of drag highlighting the fact that actually we are always wearing masks and can we ever be uh, what is the real us and can we be unmasked so let's turn to our um, respondents to get some thoughts about anything in the pamphlet and anything vanity said and anything you want so caroline um, two two or three minutes from you okay great so um compared to vanity i presume you all uh, watch dame edna everidge and I'm Madge in the corner. <laughs> and so, you know, you've got to say something has changed when Madge in the corner, with her knitting, has been asked to put aside her knitting and come and speak. So I think that kind of exemplifies that something has changed, that I'm here, here on the panel. And I think um, Vanity said, games work in an established framework. And I think that that's really important for drag. Um, in Vanity's pamphlet, In Defense of Drag, he says the drag queen is an arch other, a creature of the marginal spaces. To me, that's lovely and evocative language, and it's an important description of how drag works. So aside from being a conservative and a mother, I'm also an economist. And when I was thinking about this, I kept coming up with a saying that we have in economics, bad money drives out good. So what does this mean? Let's imagine that you have a circulating currency and it's gold coins, but the coins are being debased. If you receive a debased piece of gold, you pass it straight on to the next person. But if you receive some true gold, you keep it stashed underground. So very soon, all of the currency in circulation, all the currency that anyone sees, is the debased gold. So in everyone's eyes, the entire currency has been debased, and you know, everyone's angry, and they're out protesting. But all the while, there is true gold, and that gold is hidden away. And so this is how I feel about drag. All the drag in the mainstream, the public eye, the drag that's currently getting public attention and entering the public discourse is the debased currency. But the drag that is gold is underground. It's in that established framework. And so what's the nature of the debased drag? I think there's corporate drag and there's bureaucratic drag. You just wouldn't think those two terms would come together, would you? And they don't work. So corporate drag, to me, is the drag of RuPaul's Drag Race. I've tried to watch it, but honestly, I find it dull. It's too Britain's Got Talent, Strictly Come Dancing, even Bake Off. Um, in your pamphlet, Vanity, you say drag is a colossus in stilettos. Um, in Bake Off each week, they have the showstopper bake. Each year, it just gets bigger. Um, it's more colossus and stilettos every year. And so that's what I see across all these shows. Stuff just gets bigger. But the art, the insight, the catching at the human condition that makes for good art, I think it's being debased. And then we have the bureaucratic drag, the council tax drag, the public sector equality duty drag. I mean, these are words that just don't go together. Um, <laughs> The library, the local library needs funding. I used to be a conservative councillor. Um, they need to appeal to the public sector equality duty. So someone suggests a drag queen. Um, so I've been to one of these sorts of things. There's two, there's mums with their toddlers desperate to get out of the house. There's a local church group on Mondays, great. There's a wheels on the bus go round and round sing-along on Tuesday, great. Oh, look, the local library is doing some stories on Wednesday. The trouble is, whatever it is, we don't really care. We sit through it. Our main aim is simply to get out of the house and to chat about how the toilet training is going with our toddlers. So my question is, is that really the place for drag amongst a bunch of mums who actually want to talk about the toilet training? I also think of the performer up and out by 10 a.m. in the morning, you know, for the toddlers. And then they're home by lunchtime, all dressed up with no place to go. So to me, sadly, this is the current, the public face of drag today. And I say, who needs it? Surely the best drag, and to go back to Vanity's pamphlet, the liminal personas, the jokers in the pack, the exceptions to the rule, those arch others, shouldn't they again be creatures of the marginal spaces? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Marianne. Dan, your thoughts? I'm always fascinated, really, by some of the things you were saying in relation to uh, uh, the wider society, because it seems to me the whole of society has become camp. There is a, a sense in which uh, uh, the, the limits of, of camp 
to limp wristed homosexuals has gone now. Everybody can be camp. And there is this uh, kind of spectacular aspect of a society, you know, with that, uh, which is, you, you can see in relation to camp. Uh, and the idea of it being a broad church is an interesting notion. I mean, my practical experience of, of uh, drag was started really in the early 70s when we did what we uh, what we called uh, radical drag which meant that we made no attempt at all to be, be glamorous <laughs> but we did don frocks <laughs> and shoes uh, and all the rest of it uh, at demonstrations and uh, invasions of things like the international conference on psychosexual uh, uh, problems that we uh, inv invaded in frocks and broke up <laughs> um, and that experience of, of drag in that sense was to understand that it wasn't just a mask but it was a kind of suit of armour that when you're in drag you can do anything you can really do remarkable things you can go on the bus in the middle of the night with loads of uh, 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 drunk lads and they, they can't put a finger on you because you're in drag and it, it, you wouldn't have imagined that. It's kind of counterintuitive, just how brave and bold you can be uh, in, in drag in pursuit of, uh, of, of particular uh, political objectives. So that, that's the way I would, uh, uh, would, would come at it. And I always imagined myself as Elsie Tanner. <laughs> if anybody <laughs> imagines that. But all my friends said, no, you're not Elsie Tanner. You're... you're you're really Nana Muscuri. <laughs> but but uh, it, so it's, it seems to me that, that the, the whole question of, uh, of, of drag is in, important right across the board in terms of its political interventions as well as the, it, it, its creative uh, uh, artistic uh, aspects. But the... The demonstrations, I was really particularly attracted by the demonstrations outside the Anderton uh, Park Primary School in Birmingham, um, where lots of predominantly Muslim parents were protesting at the, at the idea of, uh, of uh, 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 sex education and the idea of inclusion of, uh, of uh, d different kinds of family life and telling the kids about this. Uh, and the... The difficulty there, it seems to me, is the, the encounter that we have with the state. Uh, and I've come to the view that, that uh, schools should not be teaching sex education at all. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the, the whole question of gender, of drag, or, or have no place really in schools at all. Uh, that schools should, should teach biology and nothing else in relation to sex. Uh, because, uh, of course, the circumstances that, that, that parents find themselves in, you know, for religious reasons or whatever, a whole variety of different reasons, um, is that, they, uh, that they, parents feel that their, their rights as parents are in some way threatened or violated uh, by the state. Uh, and so it seems to me to, uh, important to, uh, to take, uh, take it, you know, Whoever thought the state was a good idea about teaching us about sexuality, <laughs> for God's sake, uh, it seems to me a very bad idea. So, so the, in terms of uh, the drag story hour, I don't see what's wrong with it, uh, you know, in that sense. I mean, kids are, love uh, pantomime and they love all kinds of uh, uh, things in relation to, to um, uh, drag. And so... The idea that that uh, that this is dangerous is endangering children and so on. I mean, children believe in Father Christmas and the Tooth Fairy, so you know, in what sense is this a problem for them? Right. Oh, brilliant! Thank you. Thank you. Manic. Thanks. Sir. Just to say congratulations, Vanity. It's a wonderful read. Um, it's a brilliant pamphlet um, in defense of drag. Um, I found it joyous, uplifting, um, and most importantly, I think it redeems drag from the dreg. Uh, so it's drag as an art form, and it has clear aesthetics, free from identitarian politics. 
And also the pamphlet um, reminded me of something that Oscar Wilde once said, uh, or declared in his preface um, to his 1891 novel, uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray. And he wrote that, um, well, in terms of, a, you know, from a sort of literary position, um, no artist has ethical sympathies. There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are either well-written or badly written, that is all. So I think we can use Oscar Wilde's criteria uh, within the world of drag. Uh, there's the good, the bad, and the fag and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> now, I put vanity obviously not in that latter category, um, uh, certainly in the good category, uh, as, uh, in terms of Oscar Wilde's kind of uh, uh, art for art's sake um, argument. Yeah, uh, vanity is glamorous, performs a great tradition of pop ballads, torch songs, and you know, it looks gorgeous. So that's enough of my fandom worship. Um, but I suppose I'd like to kind of relate it to maybe my own uh, experience of appreciating drag. Um, and um, I'm going to show my age, but there's no doubt that in my kind of growing years, there was a frisson of desire at play. Uh, and particularly around music um, and references um, to drag and music. So, you know, as a teen, once I was able to deconstruct Lou Reed's uh, Walk on the Wild Side or David Bowie's Queen Bitch, I, I knew it stirred something in me and, uh, 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 and the storytelling within it were brilliantly crafted, very subtle, very layered uh, about true encounters they had with drag queens in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, the songs were subversive. Um, and interestingly, um, uh, trans activists tried to um, ban um, uh, Walk on the Wild Side for being transphobic. So there you go. <laughs> um, and um, as Vanity wrote, uh, writes in her book, uh, there's the panto style drag queens in popular entertainment. And again, I remember uh, weekend TV family viewing. Um, before I discovered all the uneasy Bowie and Lou Reed stuff, um, watching Danny LaRue in full regalia on TV. It was family entertainment, and we loved him. He was a great performer. Um, so those are what I'd say were the, kind of the good end of the drag um, uh, genre. Um, but then we also have the bad. And as Vanity writes, you can put a man in drag, but that does not make him a queen. <laughs> <laughs> and dare I say it, Sam Smith comes to mind. <laughs> Going to be contentious here. It's not that he's unattractive and porky. Um, oh dear. <laughs> the brilliant Divine, if you, anyone remembers Divine, uh, otherwise known as uh, Harris Glenn Milstead, who featured in John Waters' cult underground trash movies. Uh, is, in my opinion, a genius, and um, successfully crossed over into the mainstream with John Waters' um, box office film hit, uh, Hairspray. He plays uh, the lead character's mother, um, and uh, uh, Ricky Lake's obese mother, and keeps complaining about how fat he is and so forth. Um, so I'd like to put it out there for thought that maybe beautiful can be ugly, and ugly can be beautiful. That's just um, something to think about. Um, and thinking of that, Vanity references the Divine David um, in, in, um, in the pamphlet, um, otherwise known as David Hoyle. And again, he was another amazing late-night performance art genius, and a bit similar to David Bowie. He killed off his Divine David persona, um, and um, as Bowie killed off Ziggy Stardust, um, his skirt-wearing sci-fi fictional character. So... Why did, David, why did David Hoyle kill off the Divine David? It was a rebellious act against the mainstreaming of queer. I'll never forget, I can't remember the words, but his damning words about Graham Norton uh, as his fight, and I saw a performance that he did uh, at Streatham Ice Rink, um, which was produced by Ducky. It was his final performance where he killed off Divine David. Really re vicious about Graham Norton. Um, so I like a bit of cattiness. Um, and then we finally come to what? is the downright ugly, the fag end of drag. Uh, and maybe this is where Drag Queen Story Hour lies, where performers in drag read books to the very young, their kids, their mums and dads in public libraries, schools, bookstores and community centres. Why? You know, it's... What, why do they do it? Um, and I blame the promoters, you know. Uh, um, if you're going to get 100 quid for a performance, then you'll get 100 quid. Um, uh, but, you know, drag moving from the illicit, fun and dangerous to children's entertainment, you know, please, let's just kind of leave that and park that somewhere else. Um, 
we, we should bring back storytelling. Uh, and, you know, I remember the days in the 80s where we had well-meaning, worthy performers dressed in Afrocentric wear, singing kumbaya, getting the kids <laughs> to bang a bongo or fiddle about with a kora or rain sticks, uh, <laughs> listening to Nancy stories, or putting a bindi and sari on while listening to the story of Rama and Sita. Come back. All is forgiven, please. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, um, similarly to Manik, I absolutely love this letter. If you haven't read it, read it. It's just, it's really uplifting and full of fun, so thank you for that. Um, and also, it got me to look at drag queens I'd never heard of, because I really just know about Lily Savage, a couple of people I know on the circuit, and uh, RuPaul, really, that was my whole reference. So uh, it's been a really glamorous week, actually, for me. Um, and I, I just feel like the thing that stood, stood out to me was that there's so much in drag that the rest of us could do with a bit of. Um, so some of the sort of groups, if you like, that I belong to, so like comedians who are often, um, we often complain nowadays that they're too safe, that they just, that they're all compliant and that nobody wants to shock anymore. It's all about clap along lectures rather than comedy. Um, feminists, I mean, the, I feel like there's a lot of feminists could learn from drag queens, possibly. Um, <laughs> feminist comedians, I mean, you can't help everyone, but you could, um, they might benefit as well. Um, so one of the things I thought about was, uh, you read this idea in comedy that the jester plays with status because the jester belongs above the king but also beneath the peasants and bizarrely I started thinking there was something in common between Vanity Von Glow and Jerry Sadowitz um, in that respect which you wouldn't necessarily think immediately because Jerry Sadowitz has this very very low uh, low low persona and I feel like drag queens not that I'm saying you have a low persona at all you have a very high <laughs> status persona but um, but drag queens, it seems to me, are often prepared to laugh at themselves, and that's something that I just don't see very much of. Um, increasingly among comics, which is mad, but there you go. Um, there was a lovely phrase in the letter. Vanity talks about exploiting one's otherness. I thought, God, that's brilliant, isn't it? Because we're used to hearing um, about celebrating diversity, yawn. Um, and I just thought that was a much better take on that. The idea of exploiting yourself is it's just so much more self-determined and interesting and... And it's so much more honest because there's often this, this talk about victim culture and sort of capitalising on being a victim. But it's much more honest to say, no, I'm exploiting my otherness. I'm looking at myself and thinking, what's odd about me and how fabulous that could be? So I thought that was just brilliant. Um, then I thought, OK, drag's obviously a broad church. That's one of the things I got from the letter. There's lots of types of drag I'd never heard of, lots of things I didn't know about. So it feels like we're being walked into a trap to make sort of uh, sweeping statements about drag. What the hell's drag? You know, who are you talking about? Which drag? Um, but then having said that, if my idea is right that, that drag queens have this sort of um, this grit about them, then maybe it is okay and they can, they can withstand that kind of debate. Um, uh, one of the things I thought about, and I don't mean to be crude, but uh, for a long time my dad lived in Turkey in his retirement. And obviously it's a predominantly Muslim country, but we'd go out there on holiday and sometimes you'd see British women in, uh, you know, they'd be quite drunk and they'd be in bikinis where you think, Crumbs, I didn't know they made it in that size, you know. And, <laughs> and there's this feeling where you sort of wanted to apologise to the Turkish people and say, we're not all like that, we're not all like that, you know, I'm wearing trousers. Um, and I just wonder, I, don't, I didn't know until today what Vanity's relationship is to the drag queen story hour uh, drag queens. Um, but when I see performers like Ada HD, and I don't know if you're familiar, but Ada HD does this... Uh, well, has a look. First of all, where's the rainbow flag colours? Which I think is quite interesting because to me that's like weirdly conformist for Because I think of a drag queen as being somebody that invents these spectacular outfits. And the idea that you would say to somebody like Vanity, well, these are your colours and you're going to wear them whether you like it or not, just seems a bit strange to me. So, so I wonder, I'm sort of here in a spirit of exploration with lots of questions. You know, I wonder what the relationship is between performers like Vanity and Ada HD. Um, so I, I'm not a parent, so I don't know how people feel about Drag Queen Story Hour, but my sense is that it's probably down to the individual parent to, to think about what's suitable for their child, um, where that's possible. Um, it seems like censorship is a really tricky area because you start to get into this sort of, uh, like I call it the Mrs. Doubtfire problem. You know, well, what do you mean by drag? Because I, I think most people would be very happy with pantomime dames, obvious thing to say and then you get up to the leather chaps end and you think oh no I'm not sure. I mean, I've seen some absolutely shocking stuff on Twitter I'm sure we all have so can't we just get rid of the leather chaps but keep the spirit you know and my, my mum's uh, a potter and she does sort of art classes and stuff and we're saying what could a good drag workshop look like for kids 
And I don't think there's anything wrong with having the box of wigs out. You know, maybe not story out. I mean, I've heard you say that's tedious, and I think it, it might be. But I think when I was a kid, you know, we had a travelling theatre workshop that came to our school and, and did Macbeth with us. And when I say did, I mean they got the kids to be a witch and to be the king and to put the costumes on. And it was this fantastic introduction to Shakespeare, which I'll always be grateful for. It was so much better than like, a dry experience. And so I wonder whether there's some some possibility that, that, you know, especially you think of, like, if, if there are young effeminate uh, boys who are, like, gays in waiting, you know, I've got friends who, they, <laughs> they you know, they might have loved that. I remember as a kid, we, we had a friend, my brother and I, who is, who is now a, a gay adult, and whereas my brother was a very sort of typical boy, played rugby, had lots of toy guns, all that stuff, our friend Kevin had a soap collection and was much more... <laughs> well, he, he just was. And, and I remember his mum berating him once because he didn't eat all his dinner, and she said, if you do, you'll grow up big and strong like Cressida's brother. And I'm like, that's absolutely outrageous. You know, why... I just wonder if, if there's something in it for everyone. And, you know, if you had an eight-year-old like my brother doing a drag workshop, I think he would probably just dress himself up as a dragon. And st- I, I just I wonder... I think we could all... I think there's a lot to be gained from it. And particularly going back to feminism, we hear so much about women's rights. And the recent debacle with Lawrence Fox and Ava Evans is, to me, it's... <laughs> I was determined to get it in at some point. Um, I just... I feel really fed up sometimes with, with that kind of discussion. I, I think, to me... The good feminism is kind of from times gone by when women were genuinely saying, I want more opportunity. Um, I, I, there's this lovely phrase, um, so this is vanity again. If she has no backbone to take a stand against this sort of thing, then what use is the drag queen anyway? It's a privilege to become fearless. And when I hear women talking about drag as woman face, I just, I don't, I don't accept that. And I, I sort of hear Camille Parlia talking about Amazonian street smart feminism. And I think, yeah, let's just take a leaf out of the drag queen's book, you know. So that's my thoughts. Thank you very much. <laughs> so listen, let's come out to you guys. But there, I mean, there is something that, you know, when I was reading this pamphlet and thinking about it, which is that when I was 21, we had, I had a drag queen themed birthday party. I was telling Vanity about it. And it was really good fun. My now husband turned up in a bikini he made out of an SWP <laughs> flag, which with a one foot wig, and he looked awful. But um, <laughs> we weren't together then. And, um, and it was, you know, great fun. And then recently, actually, um, someone who I knew at university messaged me and said, can you remove the picture of me from Facebook? Because I'm worried that it's going to... Not that I'm worried someone's going to see me looking awful. I'm worried it's going to offend someone. Um, and there is this tension, which actually, Venter, you touch on in the pamphlet, which is there are some within the sort of, as uh, Cressida said, the sort of um, rainbow community, there is this um, sense that now actually drag queens shouldn't be mocked and that actually if you were... Uh, uh, if you were trying to be involved in the play um, and the fun and games of it, that you have to tread very carefully. There's a question of authenticity. Are you? Are you? Should you be trying to pretend to be a drag queen and donning a wig and you know, big makeup, glamorous dresses, if you're not part of the LGBTQ plus community? And so there, there is a nervousness around this. There is a tension around this. This isn't um, as much as we, we might want it to be a sort of um, just fun and games and entertainment, this has become, rightly or wrongly, deeply politicised. And I don't think the Drag Queen Story Hour is necessarily just about people being squeamish about um, short skirts and fishnets. There's something else going on here, which is me trying to give a bit of licence to the audience here to say that if you want to raise some tricky questions, feel free, we're all adults in this room and we can take it. So let's get stuck into it. Do we have a microphone in this room? Wonderful. Um, let's see some hands. So we come all the way down the front here. And we'll take four or five, um, and we'll come back to the panel periodically. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks to Sorry. the panel. Could you stand so the camera can catch yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you for the panel for um, sharing your views on this. Um, I guess I've got a couple of questions. Um, so my first question for the panel is... Given that, say, like the black and white minstrel show or blackface is rightly considered, in my view, to be quite offensive and mocking of an oppressed group, what's the panel's view on drag and the idea that it's woman face and it's mocking an oppressed group, which is women? 
Um, the second thing is on drag screen, sorry, drag queen story hour. Um, just because uh, I think a couple of comments were quite uh, saying, oh, what's wrong with it? But I just wanted to put it out there that um, the drag, one of the drag queens who does drag queen story hour, my understanding is that he actually reads a book about gender identity ideology to little kids, which that's not harmless, that's indoctrinating children who are vulnerable and susceptible to indoctrination into an ideology that's telling them that it's possible to be born in the wrong body, and that is very, very damaging. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing as well is um, what I got from the panel was that, oh, it's just a bit of fun, it's an art form. And um, I'm sure as an adult entertainment, you know, a free human beings are free to go and watch whatever art form they like. But I did hear a defence that it's not mocking women, but there are drag queens who have names who, that actively mock women's experiences and um, sexualise women. And I've seen them on the RuPaul drag show. I've seen um, a drag queen with fake boobs spraying fake breast milk over the audience, which is pretty disgusting because... Um, that is really mocking something that is very, very physically demanding for women, which is breastfeeding. Yeah. And there are also names like an abortion, um, molestia child. So, there's another one called flow something. So these are, you know, these are mocking women's experiences. So I just want to get the views of the panel. I don't know if you knew about drag queens who had those names and what you think about it. Lovely, thank you. Microphone go to this person in the aisle here. Um, Stand up if you can. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm wondering whether could we almost see um, drag as maybe not even woman face but mocking sort of hyper femininity. Is there actually maybe even like a sort of, you know, a radical feminist case for mocking these things? You know, the fake eyelashes, extensions, you know, um, stilettos, things that some can, can see as kind of... Um, I suppose restricting and confining women to, you know, um, a gender stereotype. So is this playing around with it and, and uh, satirizing it? Um, could it in, in some way, in some way, be jibing um, at something that ought to be, maybe, you know, critiqued? I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, brilliant. Bringing all the sort of extremes to the surface because obviously very few of us ever look as wonderful as you look. But I've never looked like I've never managed to look like you in my life, so and probably never will over here. Just a thought that stand, came... Stand, Pauline, sorry. Oh, stand, thanks. Just a thought that came into my mind in the discussion, and it was a great presentation and great responses, is that actually drag isn't about women at all. I think that's what I got out of it. And it made me think back to all the pantomimes and the, the family entertainment and the Lily Savages and all of these people. It actually isn't about women. It is about a knowingness. It's camp. But what is interesting about what's happening in this story time thing and using this as a vehicle to get a message across, if that's what's happening, I, I'm not that familiar, I don't know, but if that is what is happening and there's a, a message going out there, it kind of inverts what this is all about to me because in the pantomime, the whole joy of the, of the widow Twanky is that she is talking to the adults and the adults are getting, oh yeah, nudge, nudge, we get that. And the message is lost on the children. It goes over their heads. They don't know what every, why is, why is mom and dad nudging and winking and having a laugh? Because this is pure music hall, end of the peer comedy, where actually the message is not for the children, it's for the adults. And the children are just fascinated by this strange kind of apparition, this beautiful or odd or grotesque or whatever it is thing. So I think it's not about women, and it really shouldn't be about children either. It's about, it's an art form, it is. It's a, or a comedy for whatever, yeah. <laughs> Any more hands? Just pass the microphone to the front there. And, yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you, that was great. Good mm -hmm. speech. Um, I do a lot of performance studies, so what I'm going to do is just throw theories at you and see what's going to stick. I'm going to do it elegantly. Um, but I think you were all right talking about drag in context and drag in the, in the moment of time that we're in. And I think what I was were thinking about is that 
drag has been like the first victim on this kind of road to postmodernity. It was the it, it was the first victim that lost meaning in a way that we understand it, and that is because modernity is all about. You know, sorry about big words like dialectics. So it's all about <laughs> you know uh, competing ideas. So drag was in in modernity it was counterculture. It was new narratives. It was an, an against speech. But postmodernity is all about the, the way we do postmodernity is performance. That's deliberately the way postmodernity functions. And you know, our friend Judith Butler made it very clear that performance is the way we do postmodernity. And she was the first one to draw drag drag into it drag drag into it um, and said you know this these are men who play and perform gender and this is why this is the most political thing you can do and suddenly it was not fun anymore <laughs> right it was just really boring and i was working at the in germany a theater at the time so i was taping a lot of men's tits together <laughs> and i was going oh fuck this is over <laughs> 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 and but but no it was but there, there's a, there is a historical shift about the meaning of drag and you know what it's what people see its purpose for and so if we can get it back to a kind of countercultural movement to back to this kind of dialectical thinking maybe there's going uh, a lot of potential in there and a lot of more tit taping mm -hmm. lovely next to you so um, it, it, it's a, qu a, a question which kind of puts a different, uh, different sort of um, way of thinking about it on, on, on the table. So uh, with um, the way that we're talking about uh, about drag relates to uh, you know the idea of performance and kind of the the playfulness of identity and all of those things. But it does seem to me that if, if you look at, if you look historically, um, part of the Part of the, not about about drag, but rather about this phenomena in, in society. The part of what happened is it w was to do with the, uh, to to do with the you know the the idea of uh, the idea of lust and, and, and specifically, um, uh, you know, uh, being same sex attraction, you know. So I mean, I I think for example, I go into. You know, going to clubs in Manchester, and there's and there's kind of Roxy Hart on the one hand, who's kind of, uh, you know, sort of glam in a, va a vanity kind of style, and then there's um, Stella Artois, who who clearly <laughs> looks like looks like a bricklayer. You know, like you know, we're not we're not in drag, and there's, but there's something about about the uh, erotic appeal of Stella Artois. And so it's, you know, I, I'm not sure where I'm going with it, but it's, it's like something about the kind of the, you know, the idea of lust mm -hmm. and the way that that performs in relation to, in relation to drag. And I think, you know, if you think about Bowie and, and, and Lou Reed, it did kind of put on the table the idea that men could be attracted to men and that we would experience, therefore, uh, drag uh, in an erotic way, not simply at the level of performance. Great. Well, let's come back to the panel for some thoughts and we'll come out again because we've got lots of time. I think one of the... You're not going to be able to answer everything, so just a minute from you each, but one of the, the you know tensions that's coming out is it, it, does drag want to be mainstream? Obviously, RuPaul has gone some way to... Well, very far in mainstreaming it because it's a hugely popular television programme, but I've got a one-year-old, so I'm spending a lot of time in staying plays and with mums and um, I live in Hackney, so you can imagine the experience mm. I'm having. And all the mums that I'm forced to be friends with, are uh, <laughs> they take their kids on Monday to uh, sign language classes, on the Tuesday <laughs> to uh, sensory, and on the Wednesday to Drag Queen Story Hour. And it's, you know, it, you know, it's not that we're all sick of, you know, I might go because I'm sick of singing Wheels on the Bus and I'd like to, you know, say, I actually don't want to talk about anything to do with nappies or toilet training anymore. But it's not that, it's that they're going to this performance because it's, it's like, it's virtue signaling. They're like, I'm a, I'm a good hackney mum. Look, I'm tick, tick box, sign language, drag, you know, he'll become a well-rounded individual. And is that really what the, the artist wants to be part of, satisfying middle class assholes in Hackney? You know, it's, uh, uh, but, but genuinely, I think the point raised at the front here, you know, is it, it, by mainstreaming, by, by saying this is something that you must accept is okay, even okay to be shown to children, 
does that lose its edge? Should we be doing that? And, and is that part of the problem of it being politicised? Let's start vanity and move our way down the table here. Just a, a minute on sure. anything you like. Um, the, the lady referenced Widow Twanky. I thought that, that the pantomime, sort of talking over the heads of the kids. I always think that one of the most, the best device in comedy that I find is to establish a complicity with members of the audience, right? And that works when you're talking around someone. So if someone is being self-serious and the whole room's sort of chuckling and the drag queen's conducting the humour and it's all going nicely. And I think you're right to point out that I'm not sure who the complicity is established with when you're reading to kids. Mm -hmm. And it's, so therefore it misses that like curve that's necessary for the drag to really work. So I do, I think that makes sense. Um, uh, to, to the lady at the start with your comparison with the minstrel show, because I, I, I think that's quite an obvious and understandable question to ask. So, and I think it's one that deserves to be addressed. I think it's, it's a big subject. But for me, the, the big difference is, as far as I'm aware, and I don't know this in detail, but the minstrel show's minstrel performances weren't made up of people who spent a lot of time and care in creating a persona that they were proud of, that they imbued with a lot of the values that they actually treasure, like beauty, confidence, resilience, fabulousness, um, or whatever the value happens to be. I, I think that a minstrel show w existed solely for the purpose of denigration, and, and, and that's different. You know, if you ask an 18 year old RuPaul's drag race, drag race fan, you know, who watches it all the time and sits practicing their makeup, which is a, a form of visual artistry. It's a lot of work to put into something that you're doing out of, uh, out of a negative impetus. So that's, for me, the thing there. And I get what you mean with the names. You know, some of the names are, um, you know, ridiculous. Um, but I'm, I, as far as I'm aware, the, uh, the terrorist communities of the Middle East aren't up in arms about Val Qaeda. Um, <laughs> any more than uh, people who are tragically sick are upset about Diana Cancer. Um, like, there are just dumb, silly names. They're supposed to appeal to a very low part of the human mind that goes, ha ha, I shouldn't laugh, but I did. So I, I, I get that there are names where you're like, do you have to be called that? But, okay. no. Brilliant. Krista? Um, yeah, just coming back to the, the woman stuff, really. I mean, I agree. I don't think it is about women. I think it's... Possibly, I mean, I'm not sure, but maybe even, uh, I'm a really big fan of Camille Parlier and she talks about men trying to overcome women, um, although I don't get that sense anyway, that's a complicated idea, but, but just in general, I, this idea of protecting women from things is something that I'm not thrilled about because I, I feel like we sometimes try and sort of whack-a-mole uh, danger or threats to women out of existence and I, I just feel like it's a lost you know it, I don't feel like it's possible to to rid the world of things that are potentially dangerous to women and and it, I wonder whether inoculating uh, women I mean maybe I'm getting off topic here because we're more talking about kids aren't we but yeah, but I love the idea that a child would be inoculated against being uh, scared of the, having confidence I mean what a brilliant thing to instill um, and I totally accept that, that it, it depends on the specific performance. Can I, can I just jump in there? Because this is the interesting thing, which is that, is that then instrumentalising drag as an educational tool? You know, the idea, which is, which I think would then, as Don said, not, not having sex education in schools, is it that the sort of mainstream bureaucratic, maybe, Caroline World, comes in and says, oh, here's this this difficult thing, drag, this drag queen who's doing difficult things. Let's sort of, this, this should be an, uh, an educational tool that helps kids know their true self. And it kind of, it, it, it becomes a sort of, maybe a club to beat parents with. But also I, I think that, I do say this in the letter a bit, that I do actually think some drag artists instrumentalize themselves strangely and become flag bearers for a political aesthetic. And I think again, that like that's actually, I agreed with a lot of what Caroline said. It really takes the the, <laughs> the sparkle out of drag for me mm -hmm. to do that. You know, the purpose of art isn't to engineer social change, or for me, it shouldn't be. Right. Sorry, I cut you off there, but no. But I mean, maybe maybe watching Lily Savage and a couple of pantomime dames was the appropriate amount of drag for me as a kid. You know? <laughs> and it was it wasn't on a syllabus, and there was no external bodies making sneaky stuff that the parents weren't allowed to see. You know, it was yeah, maybe that was about right. Okay, manic. Um. Yeah, something to pick up on on, on uh, what Matt Maron was talking about, uh, possible, you know, kind of redeeming drag back into an interesting um, sense of um, 
counterculture and, and rebelliousness. Because, um, um, you know, I think drag probably reflects and kind of mirrors uh, our contemporary culture. You know, so back in the days we had drag queens really paying wonderful homage to Barbara Streisand, Diana Ross and so forth, and now it's kind of the twerking generation of Beyonce or Nicki Minaj or Britney, Miley, etc. You know, so, you know, who's... Uh, who's mocking who uh, in that sense um, because um, perhaps uh, as the young woman there said you know it's uh, uh, maybe the kind of this kind of difficult tension is uh, is about drag contemporary drag perhaps mirroring the kind of hyper feminity and the hyper sexualization that actually a lot of women performers are doing on YouTube and so forth and uh, uh, in, in, in pop music um, what, what I would say is uh, that there is probably, you know, lots of different um, kind of points of view to think about. Um, RuPaul was, I would say, part of the counterculture once, you know, um, and now he's become so completely mainstreamed and he had to grovel and apologise in 2018 uh, for uh, uh, saying that, um, um, talking about the dichotomy of the trans movement versus the drag movement and uh, uh, that, you know, he felt that women don't really like uh, don't really, so women don't really dress like drag queens. <laughs> They're wearing clothes that are hyper feminine. So it's the whole thing about when you identify as a woman uh, and uh, the trans movement, kind of uh, uh, saying that well, you know, trans trans women should be part of the uh, 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 drag um, RuPaul's drag um, drags. I don't watch it um, um, mm. drag show, um, and you know he got he really did get it in the face. Uh, and you know, calling him transphobic, and that uh, uh, tra uh, um, drag drag queens d should include trans women, um, and um, he he kind of grovelled and apologised and mainstreamed you know the whole thing further. I think you know, mm -hmm. and so people I think if you can be as countercultural, as, and then if you want to make it big in the box, mm -hmm. you have to play to the contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don, yeah, I'm. I'm I'm interested by the the, the idea of, of drag as disruption uh, uh, and disruption of masculinity and femininity, and I think in relation to the unease that 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 some people might feel in relation to the lampooning of women and women's experience, is is to ask why why don't we lampoon men? Right, it, it, it's, it's a question worth asking historically, it seems to me. Vesta Tilly is the only person I can think of who, who was Burlington Bursey from Bow, uh, who presented uh, the, uh, the idea of a woman playing a man. Uh, and that's worth thinking about, I think, as to the position of women in society, how it's changed and how it hasn't changed, and the re relationship between that and, uh, and drag seems to me to be a problem uh, and worth thinking about uh, without any uh, uh, other agenda of attacking conventional drag, it seems to me. Um, the other thing is the, is the point that was made about the sexuality of, uh, of, of drag. It, I always remember a film by... Uh, uh, about uh, called performance by Mick Jagger, where he turns into a woman, which is extraordinary film. I'd, it'd be uh, it's worth watching if you can catch up with it somewhere. Uh, but that kind of uh, idea of uh, of questioning uh, uh, sexuality, as in the disruptive sense, seems to me to be relevant. But I do think we we should think about why why we're not why we don't have uh, uh, some kind of uh, presentation of masculinity as being fabulous and fantastic uh, and so on because it is pretty I think masculinity is pretty marvelous. <laughs> well, but there, there have been <laughs> there have been um, drag. Uh, drag met what's the term met kings. drag kings um on Ru there has been one on rupaul's drag race and there are more there has been this kind of push to make them more um visible but is it just a case of it's not you know you 
put on trousers and a fake beard and it's not all that <laughs> exciting. You, you don't get the kind of, the scale of the wardrobe is slightly truncated the, well, when it comes well, exactly, to Well, exactly, yeah. Maybe it's that. But perhaps less of the wardrobe and more of the muscle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 we'll come back out again. Caroline. Okay, so I like what you said again, drag is disruption and drag lampooning women's experience. So on the issue of women face and misogyny, I think when you um, watch drag queens, um, RuPaul's Drag Race, it's, it's not in any sense anymore lampooning women's experience. It's, it's just so far from women's experience. I mean, <laughs> the huge wigs... As you say, the, the fake tits that are squirting the milk. It's just um, become completely removed from a kind of a subtle desire to inhabit women's experience and comment on it. And so to me, that's when you... I just look at it for a few minutes, even in pre preparation for this talk. I'm just like, gosh, there's no interest in this. There's no subtleness. There's no humour. There's no liminal space anymore. So in that sense, I think it... I actually would say it has become sort of pure... I would see it as misogynistic, just the sort of scale of the um, crassness, mm -hmm. but represented as women. But Karen, and, if I can oh. push you, does, but then does it have to play by women's rules, then? Is that, you know, are, you in, are we in danger of saying that it has to it has to tick the feminist box. Yeah, I think that's right, by the way. So in preparation, I looked at, at, at one bloke, and I just thought it was interesting that the outfit he was wearing had nothing to do with being female anymore. And I actually thought this bloke could be on um, Britain's Got Talent or anything else. So that anchoring to the female experience, I thought, but then it's not drag anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting, that one. But I do think we haven't discussed the gender ideology enough and um, as a conservative I can say the conservative party has been captured by gender ideology so <laughs> it would be very hard for the drag community <laughs> not to be captured and I think it's um, you know very dangerous and I think that a drag queen turning up at the library should have the courage to say I'm not reading this book which implies a little boy can actually be a little girl I think that's very confusing for young children but I would just love to hear actually from Vanity if um, you know the drag community should in a sense be about courage and obviously we've got this gender ideology everywhere now how could the drag community play a role in being courageous mm -hmm. and like really standing up and saying you know we can't change sex this is damaging young kids how could you be part of the resistance mm -hmm. Hold, hold that thought because I want to come back out to the audience for some more questions so let's see some hands uh, come on, be brave, be courageous, be part of the resistance, whatever that is. Right, you <laughs> there and the, and the other. Go for it. Stand up, please. Sorry to be demanding. Um, yeah, it was just, just a response to the comment about being part of liminal spaces. And the comment, I sort of agree that drag queens are at their best in those kind of spaces. But um, is it not the case a lot of those spaces are closing down? Um, gay bars no longer exist. So how, where, where are those spaces mm -hmm. for drag queens? And, and also as part of the sort of main, you know, like all my friend, gay friends complain about or people like me trying to get into heaven and things like that. You know, is there, <laughs> you know it, but, it, but it, seriously, is there a sort of, is the mainstreaming, part of the, you know, the pro of mainstreaming is that you don't get the abuse, which is what Don, you know, alluded to. You don't, the, you know, the, the, uh, the other sides to this, which is that there obviously historically have been people who have gender bended or whatever it is um, receiving, uh, you know, uh, having a bad time and being abused. And the mainstreaming helps mitigate that, but it also means that um, if, if we're all donning wigs, then is it exciting to don wigs anymore? Um, who else has a, has a, so if we bring the microphone here to the front, thank you very much, lovely volunteers. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I read a lot of Camille Paglia as well. I think she's, she's amazing. Um, she informs a lot of my opinions. Um, she once explained during the Stonewall riots that it was the drag queens that threw the first punches. Um, my question to the panel is, that's kind of changed now because of the gender ideology and the framework is that, no, it's the trans, she was a trans woman, this person called Marsha P. Johnson. She was the one that um, started the riots and me as a gay man, I have that to thank for. So I have to be silent when it comes to expressing uh, my gender critical views. 
Mm -hmm. um, second question, um, very quickly, is kind of a boring one. What is the etymology of drag? Mm -hmm. Like, where does the term drag come from? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ooh. Yeah. Get the pamphlet because vanity goes into it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Any other, any other questions? <coughs> Did you want to speak again at the front? Oh, sorry, we'll take the one at the back and then we'll come back to you. So at the back there, that gentleman there. Uh, thank you. Just a really short one um, about Caroline, what you were saying properly. Um, about the sort of reflection of it's denigrating to women. If you look at the wider society, sort of uh, characters like Kim Kardashian, you know, how things become so big and so not feminized, but her backside must be the most viewed Instagram image going. So is it really that different to what the wider world eyeballs are going to? And is there a bit almost of, for want of a better word, jealousy in that regard? Mm -hmm. I'll leave that one open. Okay, brilliant. Uh, oh, we've got some more hands here. I'm not going to forget you, but I'm going to take people who've not spoken yet. So in the hood there, or the lovely fluffy hat, whatever that is, yeah. Um, so um, just uh, two comments. Uh, the so the lady in red, I agree with <laughs> your point. Um, sorry, you're going to have to shout because can you, it's not Is this enough. on? Perfect, yeah. yeah. So just in the lady in red, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, I agree that there is some concern about it being, uh, uh, you know, um, offensive to women. Um, and um, causing, you know, distress to see um, drag queens, especially in front of children. The concern is, why is there not the same uh, moral uproar, <coughs> uproar that we would generally see if there was any cultural appropriation, if someone was accentuating, you know, a Jewish person's uh, demeanour in the same way as a drag queen is, is uh, accentuating, accentuating female, um, you know, persona. Mm. Secondly, there is a lot of hypersexualization that I do not really feel, feel is appropriate in a child's work, you know, environment. Um, do you, anyone in the, in the panel think that there are any negatives um, in the exposure of children to the sexual um, acts <coughs> in, you know, flamboyant, um, barely there dress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, that's, where's the microphone come forward? Put your hands up in the air, hi. So this guy in the glasses here. The interesting thing about the sort of playing around with, you know, someone pretending to be a Jewish person or something like that, I mean, uh, you know, there is, there is denigrating caricature, but there's also this conversation at the moment in, you know, arts and culture about whether you can pretend to be someone else. So, uh, uh, you know, quite a large uproar from certain critics about Killian Murphy, an Irish actor, playing Oppenheimer in the recent blockbuster, who was Jewish, um, and you know whether or not you can have a someone from a, you know, a white person play a Latino character, things like that. And so you know, I'm, ooh, I start to bristle when we talk about that because you know, shouldn't we be able to pretend to be other people? Um, and what does that say for artistic freedom? Go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, I think one thing I've been thinking about with. Um, Drag Queen Story Hour is the idea of a kind of escalating provocation that's going on. So, um, you know, starting with Pantomime Dame reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and then going up to sort of a glamorous drag queen doing it, and then maybe the drag queen starts dancing, and then they're dancing in a scantily clad outfit in a sexualized way, and it sort of starts to escalate as a. So, um, and I, I wonder if political activists have sort of. Um, seen the, the potential of drag to be able to do those kinds of things and um, make uh, make very political provocations, but under the guise of saying, "Oh, we, we just you know it's just the pantomime dame." Or you don't mind pantomime dames doing it, do you? Mm -hmm. um, so I was yeah, wonder what the panel think about that. Brilliant, thanks. And and next to you, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, I just I would personally draw the distinction between maybe mums going to and there was an event cancelled in in the in London I think where uh, it did seem a little sort of overtly sexual maybe from the photos but if they're babies and it's with their mum and the mum wants to get out for a gin and tonic I personally would be like yeah that that's more more or less an adult afternoon out for them whereas there are videos maybe of seven-year-olds stuffing $20 bills into sort of stripper-type drag queens. And I think they're two very different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any more hands? Uh, oh, one at the back. And I haven't forgotten you. One at the back. 
Hi, sorry if I'm repeating what any, if anyone said I'd arrived a bit late, but I just want to react to um, a few the panelists at the end and a comment here about um, women being offended by drag. I think the majority of people who watch drag are women. I don't know if I'm wrong, but um, I'm certainly not offended by it because it's I can I can understand that it's it's an act and it's something that's flamboyant and brilliant and quite funny to watch. And some and I just I don't think being offended by it is um, very valid. So yeah. that, okay, lovely. So if we come down to the front. And then we'll have some, if, unless anyone wave at me now, or otherwise we'll have final speeches from the panel. Yeah, thanks. I know it's my second time speaking, so thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted, I was really interested in what you were saying about what we don't have women kind of mocking men in the, in the same way that, you know, we, do, we have drag queens. And um, I just thought to myself, and this is just an, a theory, that is it in a patriarchal society that, you know, the idea is that men are better at everything, including being a woman. So, <laughs> therefore, that's, you know, it's just an idea. Yeah. Oh, we've got to let come up. Yes, go. Ahead. <laughs> yes, this gentleman here with the glasses. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that, because I was thinking of making the point that I think, because the panel were talking about drag kings and why do we see fewer drag kings and drag queens, because uh, I think the working assumption is for a lot of people, it's more subversive for a man to adopt uh, female-like effeminacy or to be not stereotypically male. It is still subversive for women to adopt masculine characteristics, but traditionally and historically, it's been the case that it is most subversive, and this is the realm in which, of course, drag lives, is in being subversive, that it's most subversive for a, a man to adopt feminine characteristics. And being subversive doesn't have to be being stripperish or being outrageous. It can even be being soft and kind, actually. It, that in itself is a subversive act. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. oh, and just pass it to this lady in the, in the aisle here. But it's also maybe something to think about and that, you know, the worst thing you can be at the moment is a white straight male. It's like the <laughs> worst thing you can be. So maybe it would be subversive to be an act as a white straight the bricklayer you know maybe that that's the kind of only subversive thing left anymore hi uh yeah maybe just jumping off this point here um sort of like a contextual point about the history of drag in a way um you know you get the stereotype of like young gay boys being like very into like broadway and like you know that sort of like um you know drama and stuff like that i think the reason um why you don't get as many drag king, uh, kings is that um you know, lesbians and gay men are very, very different, right? <laughs> in terms of like the things that they're like doing, like, you know, somewhat of a stereotype, like being at home and my cat, you know, that's what it is. But um, <laughs> I, I think that's also a point there as well. It's not necessarily that like, you know, lesbians don't satirize um, men and masculinity. It's just that, you know, gay men have had that, it's, like, it's part of their history, you know, that sort of like flamboyant, you know, lesbians just aren't as much like that. And Lovely. That's okay, we'll just have a last p contribution there and then we'll come to the panel, so. Um, Stand if you would. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Thank you. So when I was a kid, I thought I invented the term tomboy. Like I genuinely thought, that's me. I did that. And I think the difference for me between drag and this gender ideology issue is that drag is, I don't think mocking. I think it's playing around with gender. I think it's you know subverting it in a fun and, and harmless way. But um, when I uh, interact with teenagers now who explain to me that their uh, transitional journey comes from a place where they didn't like Barbies or pink or any of the things that I neither, you know, associated with. And then they're talking about operations and mastectomies and that's the fear for me. And I think I can separate the difference because of my own experience, but some conservative people or whatever people that don't understand the nuances of sexuality and gender look at a drag queen and think that's why young boys want to be women, which I think is, you know, totally misguided and wrong. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Right, so, so much there. You're not going to be able to even start to address any of it. So just pick your favourite point or the last thing to leave us with. We've got sort of ten minutes. So I'll give each of you two minutes and we'll start with Caroline and then with Vanity. So, Caroline, any, any closing thoughts? 
Well, yes, the one on Kim Kardashian. I mean, I just think you're absolutely right that young women are bombarded with images of hypersexualized uh, women, and this is how you need to look. Um, I have teenage daughters, and I mean, you know, they're just spending all their time on, you know, makeup and their looks and what they look like. So I agree that's a hugely important issue, and uh, we should be just as concerned about that as you know, the, the, uh, the drag race hypersexualization of women. I think it, it is the same thing. Um, I do want to also go back to the gender ideology. And uh, as you say, drag queens are uh, caught up in this idea of turning up at the library and having to read the book about, you know, the little boy who's actually um, really a little girl. And, you know, I just would love to hear Vanity's ideas on pushing back on that, because we know that the little boys most convinced by that narrative are the boys who might otherwise have grown up to be gay. Instead, they're lining up to take female, you know, cross-sex hormones and have their penises chopped off, which is obviously absolutely tragic and appalling. And so how could the drag community be more, um, actually, I would say, political, brave, push back on that narrative? Okay, thanks, Don. Right, the... the uh... I was going to save it to the end, but yes, let's tap them out. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, the, uh, I have difficulty thinking about the old uh, uh, schoolgirls' uniform, uh, where uh, when you're educating girls, they have to wear collars and ties, uh, and how bizarre that that is in our, in our social history that they immediately you have to dress girls as boys when, when you're sending them to school. Uh, and so the, the points that are made about patriarchy, I think, are, are, are kind of relevant here, you know, when we think about that. The other thought I had was about uh, everybody being trans in the past. Uh, and there's this uh, recruitment uh, of, of historical figures who are all trans. I mean, uh, I think it's nonsense, and I think we should really push back against that. I don't think there were any trans at the Stonewall Inn. <laughs> I think they were, they were either transvestites or drag queens at the, uh, at the, at the Stonewall Inn, and they weren't uh, 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 transsexuals. Brilliant, thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> Manic. <clears throat> Gosh, um, I think um, the whole area around um, uh, trans ideology and, and how that's uh, infiltrating all walks of life is, is something we had to be kind of raise awareness and be clear about uh, uh, that that's um, that there, there is something uneasy uh, about it um, but you know I would um, still like to kind of say that you know drag is an art form and um, I know less about drag kings, you know. Um, I think I remember French and Saunders sometimes dressing up as some builders <laughs> and stuff like that and exaggerating male culture or male working class culture, perhaps. Um, Kevin and Perry. Hmm? Kevin and Perry. Kevin and Perry, yes, yeah. yes. I don't watch much pop culture. So, yeah, it, it exists, you know. People are um, man facing, or <laughs> uh, women are man facing uh, in, in, in entertainment. So, that's great, um, you know. Uh, that's what entertainment's about. So, um, uh, I, but I think um, what is what we're kind of um, what we're missing, uh, and it would be great is to see you know the, the kind of bringing back drag into uh, uh, as a form of arts, as a form of uh, popular um, culture, and um, uh, and and it's uh, the, the, the playfulness is, is really important. Um, that, you know. Some, someone like you know, um, Sam Smith takes himself far too seriously compared to <laughs> Elton John, who used to play around a lot you know, as a bald guy you know, in the 70s um, with um, his feathers and stuff. You know. And um, he's got hair now, but you know, he, did, he was bald back in the 70s. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, working class blokes in, in makeup and, um, uh, and sequins uh, uh, you know, who were builders, you know, but likes glam rock and the sweet and slaves, you know, that, that kind of playfulness is really exciting. I think we just need to kind of get back the fun back, but also that it is a, a subversive and interesting art form. You know, I think uh, uh, someone like Divine, who I thought was an amazing um, uh, actor, actress, um, um, was, you know, really did, I think, kind of put the subversiveness back in, <coughs> in your face. 
kids should, you know, just, yeah, they'll dress up. They enjoy dressing up. I remember my boy used to kind of like to dress up sometimes as a Muslim kid, you know, or something like that, and sometimes in a kilt and feeling quite feminine and stuff, you know. Um, so, so that playfulness is fine. We shouldn't kind of lose that. Brilliant. I'm really interested in this idea about mocking men. I mean, I would say, like, you know, look at adverts and mainstream TV, and if not that, come to a comedy club. Like, men are fair game. Like, there's a lot of, <laughs> oh, aren't men awful punchlines that I see, anyway. Um, although it's, it's a different kind of thing. And I watched um, an essay by Christopher Hitchens recently about why women on average aren't funny. I've put the on average in, um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, I didn't find it offensive at all, because, you know, we, we're just... Uh, I, I don't, I don't know, we're different, we're different and mocking. It's like I always think there's, the idea of a male stripper is just so ludicrous to me. <laughs> and I don't know who the women are that go, I promise you, when I'm on dating apps, if I see a man with no shirt on, that is a swipe left. There's no, I don't know, it, I just don't think we're the, we're the same thing. So, um, so mocking men is, I, I don't know, I guess they're doing what Speak they would like. <laughs> right, well, exactly, exactly. Yes, we, we assume that other people want what, I don't know. Um, this thing about, there's a lovely... Uh, thing that Vanti said in the pamphlet, performers should be allowed to not be moral exemplars. And I think, oh my God, yeah. I saw this interview with uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker years ago who uh, made South Park. And they said, our job is to hold up a mirror and to ask questions as we shouldn't be answering them. And you just look at modern comedy and think, yes, stop answering the questions. I'm so bored of hearing what I should be doing from a comic. Um, and just the last point, you, you were talking about it all being hijacked, like escalation. And, and I do feel like drag... Um, it, it's like it's ripe for being hijacked. And bear in mind the, um, for want of a better phrase, the, the rainbow uh, people um, have... <laughs> but you know who I mean, the people who, who are... They're, they're defined first by their sexuality before anything else. They've, they've hijacked the RNLI. You know, like, of course they're going to go for drag. I, I, so it must be infuriating for people who want to be in that space and not be their campaign. And I don't feel like it's your job to do that personally brilliant thanks very much um, <clears throat> I've, it's very hard to thread all these now um, <laughs> I've met Kim Kardashian and I can tell you that um, her butt is actually bigger than mine right now which if you can't see is indeed in, in, enlarged with the padding right um, and I remember when I was first, 15 years ago, when I was first performing, there was a drag queen in Glasgow called Musty Gusset, <laughs> who, said, <laughs> who said to me, she was like, why don't you want great big tits? And she, her drag was like Dolly Parton, that's what she looked like. And I was like, oh, I don't know, it's silly, because I, I laugh thinking about it. I'm like, I was, in my head, I envisaged my drag was going to be a bit more like... Nicole Kidman, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I just thought the idea that you have to have a you know huge tits and all, all of those cartoonish successes weren't going to be in alignment with the persona that I was trying to create to do the types of shows that I wanted to do. I always <laughs> think my comedy and my humour kind of works with a slight Maggie Smith esque scepticism, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that that doesn't really that that doesn't require to have these these enormous enhancements. Um, and I was thinking, even when you said earlier on, you were like, oh, I, I could never look the way fantasy does. And it's like, well, I mean, it, literally, if I sat and did this makeup on you, and, and, and this, you, would, you would look absolutely preposterous. Mm -hmm. The scale is completely different. I'm quite a bit taller and everything. And, you know, that everything is, uh, there's a lollipop effect. The hair is bigger than my shoulders to make my shoulders not look as big as they are. Um, there's all of this geometry that goes into creating the aesthetic. Um, and I always think, like, you know, like, I, I don't feel like what I do really has anything much to do with my mum or my sister, who's got a, you know, a kid who's two years old as well. And, like, like they're women doing the things of an actual life. And I don't have a huge interest in, in exploring that level of detail, because I'm not an actor, you know? I'm a, I'm a, a vaudevillian. And when Caroline... Um, mentions you know that the female experience is sort of is in, is invisibilized by drag to an extent or it's not present and you are right to point out and we've not talked about it too much but um you can all think about it <laughs> you know day med and average was very much a, a send-up of middle class sensibilities lily savage was the same construct but it was a little boy's vision of looking up at the working class women around him and i do think that although barry humphreys was straight 
Um, he would probably be claimed by the queer identity for his creativeness if he hadn't said things that people don't like him saying. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, that like, there's often artists, but often gay boys in particular, uh, can be quite sensitive. And be, uh, there's reasons why they're quite um, hypervigilant about what's going on in environments around them. So I think that uh, my favorite movie in the whole world is Steel Magnolias. It's absolutely hilarious. And it's written by a gay man who... Uh, he would go to the salon where his, all the women of his community gathered and got their hair done, and he listened to the gossip. It's the funniest film I've ever seen, and it still makes me laugh, Sally Field, Julia Roberts. And what I love about it is this was a gay man looking from a small posture, looking up and just seeing these women in their strength and, and their big country hair and all that and their excesses. And I think it's part of why a drag queen would love that movie. And I think that um, sometimes... Uh, gay people, young gay people, see those things, but at the same time are amused by some aspects of it. So I, that's why I'm clear to say drag worships excess, but it also finds it amusing. It, 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 it's grandiose and it's humbling at the same time. Um, I think finally, I don't want to dodge Caroline's point about um, the gender ideology aspect, because I think it would look like I'm being slippery if I didn't address it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> keeping in mind that right now we're in a climate where, I mean, there's a, you know, there's like a cancelling line and you can go right up to it and if you cross over it, you'll never work again. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my friends who's a drag queen describes Sam Smith as being a jeans and t-shirt gay who thinks he's Lee Bowery. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's the sort of thing that you, know, you get jumped on if you say it. So there are... There, I'd say that you're asking for courage from people that might agree with your stance on gender ideology. First of all, most of the drag queens I know don't agree with your stance on gender ideology. And two, any of them that did would have quite a, a conundrum to navigate the upward maze of how they could vocalize that. And so, you know, it, <laughs> if it makes any sense, with the wholesale backing of certain aspects of gender ideology that you might be concerned about, uh, the drag community might be the last to turn on that. And I do think that it's interesting because I think the best thing about drag is that it sees everything in a playful sense. And obviously, you know, I have friends who are trans, I've had friends who've transitioned or are transitioning. I understand the, that's, that's a rigorous physical journey that many of them are undertaking. And um, what I would love is for young people to see the dress up box and to see that they can access everything in it without necessarily that meaning a physical intervention or a medical intervention. <laughs> but, but at the same time, that is with respect to the people I know who are adults who have transitioned. So I just think that the conversation isn't there for that to be a thing yet. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> I would actually make a very good drag queen because that is the danger of having size eight feet. I've just taken the microphone out. Listen, thank you so much, Vanity and the panel, for that really fascinating discussion, all your questions. This is on sale upstairs, and I think that if you bought one, you might strong-arm Vanity into signing it. Um, so go and get a copy. It's fantastic. But also, there are some... Uh, and the bookshop's got great discounts. If you spend 30 quid, you get 10% off. 50 quid, you get 20% off. The signings going on at the moment are Heather Brunskill Evans, who's got a book out on transgender body politics, might be relevant, Philip Cunliffe on sovereignty and Brexit, Peter Hitchens on revolution betrayed, Nabila Ramdani, who's come over from France talking about a broken republic, and Jake Wallace-Simons with his book Israelophobia. There's lots of sessions still to go. Have a great time. Go buy some books. See you later. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>